Hello and welcome to Ecumenical Matters, the Father Ted Podcast. I'm your host, James McInespy. So this is the YouTube version of the podcast. I've taken out some of the uh, material that dates the podcast and tried to make it more timeless. So please like and subscribe. Thanks and bless you. Would be an ecumenical matter. Hello and welcome to Ecumenical Matters, the Father Ted podcast. We're up to episode 11 now. Uh, I've been miscounting the last couple of weeks because I was saying we were at uh, episode 8 when we were actually at episode 9. And I said we were up to episode 9 when we were actually at episode 10. But we are now actually at episode 11. Marty's in that class. We're in double figures. It's great. It's great. Uh, we're double figures. And it's the proper double figures. It's like, do you know the way the year 2000 is actually the last year of the old millennium? Mm-hmm. 2001 is actually the first year of the new millennium. It's like, uh, episode 11 is the first episode that's actually in double figures isn't that great it's brilliant isn't that great? So 10 is like the really the last single figure and actually number. excitingly it was, uh, what this episode is 11 there is no points there's no 11 points oh yeah, you're in the uh, no points New, new point, <laughs> as we say. Uh, and the voice you just heard there is uh, one of my dearest friends Marty Devine who is uh, the biggest Euro f- Eurovision file uh, person I know is that our word Marty? I don't think Eurovision file is a word, but uh, Eurovision fan. Eurovision fan. Uh, and you're also a, a very noted comp- uh, composer and musician. So uh, tell us a bit about what you're working on at the minute. Well, at the minute, I'm actually working on a Eurovision song for the Eurovision Song Contest. And I'm going to be pitching it to many different countries, not just one. Um, Fantastic. Yep. I've, very apt. I've just finished writing it, and um, I'm just looking for a performer and to what, sing it now. Uh, What's the song now? You have told me before that it was a song that would be specifically for Ireland, but you said it doesn't necessarily need to be a, an Irish song. No, it doesn't need to be an Irish song. It's called The Drinking Game, right. and it's about a girl who goes out and gets drunk and kind of regrets her accent somewhat, but um, I think it'll be fun, and it's actually really, really apt for Eurovision because it's something different. Oh, brilliant. And uh, you're looking for a singer as well, is that right? I'm looking for a singer uh, aged 18 to 25 with uh, an amazing voice, but also a wee bit of character about her as well. Because I think now with Eurovision, you need to have that act. Yeah. It's not just about the song anymore. So I'm not looking for a performer who wants to be themselves. I kind of want them to go in and be their, be this person that I want them to be. And we're recording a video as well. So hopefully it'll be fantastic. Good. But it used to be just be about the music, man. It's not about the music <laughs> anymore. It's about everything. It's about everything. It's about the whole presentation, really, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Full stage show. Yeah. Uh, so... We're up to season two, episode five, A Song for Europe, which you may have gathered at this point is about the Euro. Well, it's about Eurovision and Eurovision culture, really, uh, which was very, very prevalent in Ireland in the mid 90s. But I've got a few wee messages to listeners. I'll have a few shout outs to make. And Rachel McElmoyle, Moyle, who's a new convert to the podcast, she's never been watching Father Ted before, but she's now listening to the podcast. So hopefully we can. We can uh, convert her to be a Father Ted fan. Well, you're getting new fans every day, aren't you? Well, hopefully, hopefully. And Father Ted's getting new fans, which is probably the most important thing about this podcast. Exactly. If I can, if I can bring it back to the new generation, I think it will like give them back to the world. What do you think? Yeah. And there is a bit of sad news today. Actually, in the last few hours, we got the we got the news of the passing of Carolina Hearn, who was a brilliant uh, comedian and actress. Uh, she's famous for Mrs. Merton and the Royal Family, and she was in the Fast Show as well, which is where she would have crossed paths with Graham Linehan because one of his early jobs was actually a, a staff writer on the Fast Show. Not a lot of not a lot of people know that, uh, but he was in the early episodes of the Fast Show. He was involved. Uh, do you have any memories of Carolina Hearn, Marty? I think my uh best memories of Caroline Heron was just the Royal Family. I think the Royal Family was just this complete unique show that was that was different to everything else that was on T V at the time. It yeah. was just an ordinary family sitting down watching T V and really could and actually that's the funny thing is that she was in Gogglebox as well. And uh She was, was she? Yeah, she done the voice of Gogglebox. Oh okay. So that it makes was sense, actually right? really funny how um it actually transcended to Gogglebox I didn't sitting watching that, a TV I didn't know that she was still working at all at the moment. I, didn't, I didn't even know she had cancer which is what she yeah. really died of but yeah her uh, last gig was Gogglebox and yeah. now actually it's been handed over to um, her husband in the show which is oh fun to Jim yeah or not Jim uh, Pat Cash uh, Craig Cash Craig Cash is his name yeah so we might as well get straight into it then uh, so in 1996 Ireland was a Eurovision powerhouse Ireland was a Eurovision powerhouse in 1996. They just came back of three back-to-back victories in 91, 92, 93. 
actually I'm lying, 92, 93, 94. Right. Uh, the winner in 95 was Norway. Who, uh, Norway? Norway, Norway, which um, the fiddler was from Ireland. And 96 was... The comeback year. It was the comeback year. It was a bit. It was a bit of a, a bit of a. You know, they were on the beach a bit for the ninety five tournament, were they? Well, they, they didn't have their head in the game. They didn't have their they head in the game. They were just it in, I think, were they? Yeah, I think RT was about to go bankrupt at that stage. So. Well, we'll get into that a bit later on in the episode when when it actually comes up because I do want you to chat about that. Um, but to get into the episode, then it opens up with Ted humming. Uh, what is it? Nas Nasin Doman. Can you? Nasin Dorma. Nasin Dorma. Yeah. Uh, do you, can you hum that for us? Marty, that was the most uh, terrible estimation of that tune I could possibly. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> You're supposed to be the musician. You're not the first person to say that to me today, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, unfortunately, I'm not a singer. That's why I like to stay on the page. <laughs> on the page. Well, you're, you're the important guy. You're like the, the Aaron Sorkin or the, you're the Shakespeare. The exactly. singer can be replaced any time. Do you know what? That's all you need. You just need a new singer. But you know what? You, a song needs a good singer nowadays. Well, it does. But, you know, you can hold it over the, like, over them like the sort of Damocles because you can just get singers five for penny these come days. Come to me. Come to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nessun Dorma, which was made famous, of course, by the late greats. There's going to be a first of a few late greats uh, today. Uh, the late great Pavarotti. This was his most famous tune, and um, I mean, he was also quite famous in the mid '90s. So, I mean, this episode is very much rooted in its time, mm. but yet it has seemed to have uh, maintained a timelessness by just being a sort of a time capsule of that particular era of, well, Eurovision fever, I suppose. I think Eurovision fever. Um, I think you know, at this point in time, Ireland wasn't really good at anything. They weren't good at football. The fact that Ireland did keep winning Eurovision was monumental in Ireland, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a, it was a definitely national pride. Yeah. You know, years before, I heard my mother talk about sitting listening to the wireless. The wireless, um, yeah. Everyone got together and, you know, if they were lucky enough for someone else to have a TV next door, they would all get round and watch Eurovision. And I think, uh, you know, coming off Johnny Logan won in the 80s and then they had just had these three amazing wins in a row. It was definitely Eurovision fever just hit Ireland. Well, exactly, as you said, it was a real source of national pride, and I have spoken about different things that Ted has uh, that Ted has touched on about just the position Ireland was in at that time, because you had this country coming out of, basically the whole world was just thinking of it as just uh, drunkards who had potatoes with iron sweaters on, and that's all the people thought of Ireland, mm -hmm. and then you two came along and that sort of changed things, but then in the mid-90s, Things were coming thick and fast. It showed the diversity and breadth of Irish culture. Well, yeah, um, it was the Celtic Tiger, wasn't it? It was like well, Ireland the Celtic really Tiger was to follow, and I would actually, I would actually appropriate the Celtic Tiger uh, to things like uh, Father Ted, and also possibly to the Den. You know, Dustin yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, Zig and Zag and Ray Darcy and River Dance. You uh, know, yeah, and the which River was the midtime show in Eurovision nineteen ninety four. Well, exactly. And actually got bigger applause than the winner of the song. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, well, no, nobody actually remembers what the, the song was, but everyone assumes the Riverdance was Ireland's entry, yeah, which yeah. it wasn't. It was just like the halftime show. Yeah. It was just like the sort which of midterm uh, entertainment. Which was cobbled together in a week. It was... Um, really? Yeah, it was really interesting uh, because Ireland won it and they had to do three... They had nothing left to show, so like they heard that someone was doing a, a dance trip, so they're like, oh yeah, let's get this in. So about... You know, three or four weeks worth of contest, they were like, right, you're performing. And it turned out to be a world sensation. Well, exactly. It was a sensation. It even showed up on Father's Head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to get back then, so Dougal has, has a record collection, or he's going looking for his record collection. It starts off with very humble beginnings, because as we find out, he only has one record. One seven inch. Poor Dougal. Poor yeah. Dougal. He doesn't have a lot much in life, but at least he's got a record. He's, you know. Well, he's got his, his uh, burgeoning record collection. It will actually get much bigger and they'll move into much more experimental territory in season three when he starts getting uh, BBC sound effects albums and <laughs> playing them. So it's. But he, he, uh, his one record is the, the fifth, the entry that came fifth in a song for Norway in 1975. So he's a proper Eurovision hipster. He is, you know, he's uh, he really loves Eurovision, and yeah. that's a, like the fans of Eurovision are. They know who won, what year he. They know what came third that year and how many points they've got. There's something I've not really got into, but um, no, no, you haven't got into the stats of it. Just uh, more the songs. Yeah, right? there's some, there's some super fans, super fans. It was 1970. 
I think it was 75. 75. Ireland came second that year, actually. Oh, really? With what? Yeah. Uh, that's what friends are for by the Swalbricks. Swarbricks. Swarbricks. Well, you mentioned that one. That's uh, the video for My Lovely Horse, which we'll get onto, uh, was heavily inspired by the video for that song. Um, so I'm going to have to check that out and hopefully put a clip on the put a clip on the podcast. Um, but yeah, Graham Linehan and Arthur Matthews could describe that as the funniest music video they'd ever seen. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to check that out. We'll have to we'll have to get that viral again. We will. I haven't yeah. seen it. I haven't seen it. But well, incidentally, Norway came ninth that year. So. Oh, did they? <laughs> well, he doesn't get into the stats of it. He just knows this uh, random. Uh, random stats off the top of his head have you ever had any seven inches i haven't had a record player never no. never had a record player you know i've always been on tapes tapes i was tapes i grew up well i started with tapes and i sort of hit cds when cds were um were sort of yeah. at their peak yeah what was I, the first I, cd you bought uh first cd Ooh, that's a good question it would have been probably an oasis in fact it might have been eminem M and M. Yeah, it might have been M and M's first album. No, I'm not thinking back. It. I had a tapes, uh, a few Oasis tapes and stuff. Mm. But see, a lot of stuff I got hand me down from my cousin. When I say hand me down, I was at his house and just tapped myself, and <laughs> 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 uh, as you do, you know. Uh, but I sort of built up a record, a CD collection um, of about ninety CDs odd. And just behind you, right, literally one hundred and eighty degrees to your good self, we inherited a CD player in this new flat that we're in, and. Uh, I sort of missed not having CDs to hand that I could just plug in and just put on. So there's about five CDs over there. So you, you do get you do get sick of listening, if you like. Well, I do, and I, I do see a CD over there that uh, you've definitely downloaded off the internet here. Well, no, now, as a songwriter, I would uh, find that very. It's repulsive. actually it's actually not. It's a mixtape, but yeah, I'd say the source of the values <laughs> that went on that mixtape probably were uh, illegally distributed. And I'm will just say I'm very much against piracy. Like that's the reason I haven't watched any Game of Thrones because. I, d- I don't torrent. I'm, yeah, I feel too guilty yeah. about it now, as a performer and knowing so many struggling performers. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm the same. It's it's hard. It's hard out there, especially nowadays. Well, I was I got into watching a few YouTube clips there of just interviews of films, and uh, one of them was Edward Norton and Brad Pitt discussing Fight Club at the time. But films like that that were really sort of experimental and off the beat were being made all the time in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Now they're not being made at all. You know, there's no sort of really sort of jarring sort of get told by Mrs. Doyle that he's got a lovely voice mm-hmm. uh, when he's singing his uh, Ness and Dorma uh, so he starts singing Paris in the springtime and then she fucking slaughters him <laughs> what a fucking bitch she says oh you got a lovely voice no no actually you're, you're a pile of shite <laughs> <laughs> well that's Mrs. Doyle yeah well I mean it's uh, it's very vulnerable you put yourself in a very vulnerable position when you sing to request yeah if you're not a professional like if you are just you know just a person and then to be absolutely swathed down like that it's uh... <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's the that's the joy of being a performer isn't it it's um it's really hard to get up and sing to people and uh mrs doyle would probably be one of the the great critics well she, she doesn't hold back anyway uh, <laughs> and she's supposed to she's supposed to have some reverence for the for the priest like she's she's the housekeeper yeah, have you noticed as well, by the way, in this episode, her boil moved down her face a bit different? I did not notice that her boil moved down her face. Well, usually her boil is like just there between her nose and her yeah. lip. Whereas in this episode, when they're, at least when she's watching Ted and Dougal on the, play the sort of song for the first time, the really terrible version. Yeah. It seems to just be right actually, on top of her, her lip. <laughs> yes, I did actually notice yeah. that. Um, when we were watching it earlier, I um, I did notice that her boil was just... Yeah. Why? Yeah, what was it there for? <laughs> Is she sad? Is Possibly. her face just so shocked? <laughs> it's like oh, it, 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 everything just drops. Yeah, the reverse face lift. <laughs> or, or, or maybe well, exactly. Yeah. Maybe that's uh, maybe Noriel thought she was really worth this <laughs> and gave her like a you know a, a, a Botox injection. What, what do you call it? Collagen? And all that yeah. sort of stuff. It's the craggy island look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get the craggy island. Look. So who would be modelling that? Would it be Kate Moss or would it be what's her name? Maybe Naomi Campbell. Possibly, possibly. I was thinking, what do you call her with the eyebrows? Carla Delevingne. Oh, yes, yes. I, th- I think she'd yes. be more at home at Craig Island. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about that. You know, she likes to have fly in high circles. Well, she could get in the helicopter. Do you think she would go there with Taylor Swift and the posse? Well, who's the posse? Has, has Taylor it, Swift's got a posse. Did you not know this? She has a, has a crew, does she? Yeah, she's got a crew. But I think uh, Beyonce's crew, if she actually got a crew together, would beat them hands down. I think that's probably going to be World War Four. 
we've already got World War Three sorted out with Brexit and all that yeah, there. Which yeah. We'll probably mention at some point in this episode, <laughs> but uh, World War Four will just be all the super fans fighting against other super fans. And the Eurovision super fans. Yeah. They will even fight even more. It, that'll be the different theater. That'll be a different front. <laughs> <laughs> Ted was reading the Irish Catholic newspaper, uh, and the headline was the anti-divorce lobby, I think it was, because anti-divorce lobby considered legal case. So it sort of puts this episode again into its time capsule, Mm -hmm. that Ireland was still reading from a divorce referendum that had only happened one year before that. Like, uh, before that referendum, divorce was illegal. You could not get divorced. Like, it seems fucking mental now. That's only 20 years ago, like, that's in our lifetime. Well, exactly. Um, you know, there was a point where contraception was legal in Ireland, um, and at the minute, the abortion referendum is completely. You know, there's people on both sides who are very passionate about yeah, it. Um, yeah. And thankfully, every time Ireland has had a referendum, it's actually went the right way. Yeah, especially it, with the gay marriage referendum as well. And that was just last year as well. Yeah, that was just last year. Actually, it was actually the results came out whilst. I was at Eurovision Song Contest. Oh, fantastic. Yes, was, fantastic. Yeah. So Ireland became the first country to legalise gay marriage by popular vote. Yeah. 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 So another reason to be proud of Ireland. It's a, Yeah, it is another reason to be proud of Ireland. Um, it's the best little country to live in in the world, if you ask me. But Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I mean, the Irish people, once again, the Euros, the fans have just given themselves like absolutely everything to be proud of. Somebody said the Irish fans are the only fans in the world that have their own fans. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. Actually, when you see that, um, the, the Irish joint with the Northern Irish fans. The uh, Irelands. The Irelands. I, I want to make that happen. I want to make that a thing. <laughs> the Irelands. Just like yeah. you tried to make Guinea a thing. Guinea is a thing. You go to a pub and if you want a Guinness and another Guinness, you go to the barman and you say, can you give me two yeah. Guinea, please? <laughs> well, didn't they win like, the key to the city or some sort of award for being the best fans? In, in that, Paris, yes, that's right. Isn't yes. that brilliant? Yeah. So Jiggles joke about Carnegie Hall. How do you get there? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? With a lot of practice. With a lot of practice. Do you know what's about Carnegie Hall? Is anyone, any legendary performances you know of? Well, I think uh, the most infamous performance in Carnegie Hall was um, subject of a recent movie. What was that? Florence Foster Jenkins, The Nightingale from Hell. Uh, please explain. I'm not uh, sure I'm not it was it. a new movie out there a couple of weeks ago with um, Hugh Grant and Meryl Streep. And right. Meryl Streep uh, played Florence Foster Jenkins. So she was a piano virtuoso, which was not explained in the video. Um, she was amazing at piano, child prodigy, and she damaged her hands, so um, she she couldn't perform. But she always was um, like wanted to sing, but her father was like, no, no, you are terrible. You are actually terrible. Um, sort of like Mrs Doyle yes <laughs> <laughs> they just give it to her straight yeah, yeah so they um they decided that she was going to um she was like she married some rich man and he died he actually gave her syphilis and um well all the great music people have had syphilis so <laughs> so unprotected sex is a way to musical stardom yes that... musical stardom but she she fell down Carnegie Hall and it was uh, like hang on a second I just have to go rip up my, my Jurexes <laughs> <laughs> so she wanted to um sing Carnegie Hall and she did she filled it out and she was terrible but you know the um, don't be afraid to fail is that the moral yeah, is it yeah exactly and uh, now that you've mentioned the story I think I do actually know that but there's actually two films coming out this year about the exact same thing yes there's another um, one coming out I don't know anything about that one but um, I don't I know think it's got two. as much star power but it's yeah, and another one of Florence Foster Jenkins is that her name yeah so there's hope for me yet and you know there's hope for Dougal and maybe even Ted well, we'll, see. well, they you did know. get their moment in the sun. They yeah. got their time on the stage. Dougal reckons it could be famous, like Nelson Mandela and his mad wife. <laughs> 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 that also, by the way, brought up the divorce thing because Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela had literally just divorced on the 19th of March, 96. This episode aired on April 96. So it was only weeks ahead of this. Now, they probably filmed it ahead of that, but I'm sure the news would have been... Mm-hmm. They would have like the finalization of the divorce was on the nineteenth of March. I'm sure the fact that they were getting divorced was was already big news. Like so, uh, yeah, crazy. It's a uh, it's a crazy world we live in, but uh, we're yeah. weathering the storm. Yeah, we're weathering the storm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that's another uh, again, like I said, another late great Nelson Mandela. Too many of them in this episode, but Ted says they they could never. They could never aspire to be the great songwriters like Cole Porter, who was famous for Kiss Me Kate, and he, he actually won the first Tony Award for the best musical. Did you know that? I did not know that. Well, there you I go. That's your bit of trivia that. from myself then. Uh, for uh, I think that was Kiss Me Kate. George and Ira Gershwin, who of course is famous for uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Rhapsody Wo- Wonderful piece of classical music. One of the very, I think it's one of the first marriages of classical and jazz. Yeah, I think um, I think Rhapsody in Blue was Rhapsody in Blue was. Um, 
losing amazing piece of music and I actually just watched it in London there about oh, really? last year. Yeah, I watched um, Rhapsody in Blue and it was it was it was spectacular. I can't really who, where was it the Barbican or something? Did it perform? It right? was in Islington, yeah. Okay, right. And um it was it was just such a spectacular performance. And they actually had a children's choir as well singing. Um, as a side piece, but you know, it was just it was an amazing performance. Right, was, okay, really. uh, And the other great songwriter he mentioned was Christy Berg. Well, Christy Berg, you gotta love Christy Berg. Well, it, it's hard to. Leading in red. Your harmonies are right there. Your harmonies are right. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> no, my I harmonies. It, I think it was me. It was me. I'm ready for my close up. <laughs> I'm always harmonizing because I can never sing in tune. Yeah, I see. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, I do actually have trouble. Like happy birthday gives me real trouble. It actually recently just went out of patent in Europe a couple of days ago, did it? Well, there was a big court case in America about it. Mm. Uh, basically, for the listeners, it's uh, there was always this rumor going around in filmmaking that you couldn't use happy birthday because you had to pay royalties to this family, and that was true. They would would mm-hmm. uh, aggressively seek any payments if you used it on a recording. There uh, was I, a Thirty Rock episode about it, I think. Was there? I haven't yeah. seen that. Yeah. Uh, which I don't really get because a. How the fuck is it not just falling out of copyright in the first place? B, how can you enforce that? Uh, mm-hmm. like, happy birthday has been going since about 18, 1890 or something. Like it should be well out of copyright by this stage, and the estate should have been, you know, should have been finished. But somebody actually challenged it and brought it to, I think it was American Supreme Court, who finally said, "Look, you're you're talking about your arse. You can't actually prove you own this song. Yeah, uh, never mind uh, the fact that it's it should have been out of copyright about forty years ago." So that's uh, that's a big deal in the film and music industry. Happy it's, birthday! Yeah, so now, now they don't have to use that. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> Lisa, it's your, your birthday. birthday. <laughs> Fuck, we're getting all singy songy here. Exactly. It's, it's, it's like, like an Irish Christmas or something. <laughs> oh, it's like um, it's like sitting down pre Eurovision drinks. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. Uh, which Ted seems to love as well. Well, actually, uh, Jack. I can just imagine Jack at the Eurovision Song Contest. It would be a very interesting thing to see. Well, he, he hopped on the hopped on the, the board with the Norwegian, the successful, yeah. or sorry, Belgian uh, crew. <laughs> he ju- jumped on their bandwagon very, very quickly, didn't he? When yeah. they realised that his entry was uh, was a sinking ship. <laughs> but did we meet Dick Byrne? He's, it's only his second appearance. Uh, Dick Byrne. I thought he was actually in a lot more. Dick Byrne challenged him to into the Eurovision. Now, it's weird that Dougal came up with this idea and then also. On uh, Rugged Island, Dick Byrne and and uh, etc. come up with the idea to enter Eurovision, or Eurosong, excuse me, Eurovision TM. Yeah, <laughs> it really inspires Ted to get on board then with the idea of getting the song going. Get the guitar, Dougal. <laughs> get the guitar. <laughs> well, I think the both of them are just nemesis. Yes. Or are they nemesi? Well, let's not get into that. Okay. There's too um, many. Yeah. Oh, we'll be here all day. <laughs> so they're um, yeah. I think the both characters are exactly opposite. You know, Craig Island. Rugged Island, you know, it's just well, they're exact opposite by being the exact same. They're they're literally butting heads at yeah, every yeah. opportunity. Like, do you ever do you ever introduce friends who you think would get on like a house on fire because they have so much in common? It's like, oh, you you, you just love all this stuff, and you, you actually introduce them, and the two of them just absolutely butt heads. They could just hit each other yeah, from the get go. They do because they're like, no, that's my thing. I, I like <laughs> such and such cult fifties um, book before you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that has happened to me so many times, and we, you know it becomes so awkward then because you want to have a good night out with friend A and also a good night out with friend B. You think you get A and B together, you've got brilliant night out. Uh, it just no. doesn't work sometimes. Yeah, people A. Eh? Some people just like being the center of attention, unlike me. But uh, <laughs> you know, I've never yet met someone like me. Maybe I need to move to Rugged Island. Possibly, yes, possibly. I'm sure I'm sure there is. There's a, a Divine Marty somewhere to wow. go with your Marty Divine. I'm, I'm sure there is. There's no James McNespy, though. <laughs> uh, is there a McNespy James? Well, uh, McNespy, there's a Ryan McNespy plays football for Monaghan now. He's actually, it's becoming really weird hearing the word McNespy on the radio and TV so often, and people actually pronouncing it right. Well, that's true. That yeah. is true. Like whenever I, uh, whenever people see my name written down, they assume it's McCannisby or. Well, you know, we've also got <laughs> Councillor Noma. So. Who's Councillor Noma? Sorsha McNespy. Who's that? Never oh. heard of her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, that's my sister. <laughs> uh, when she said councillor, I, I thought you meant that. For some reason, my head went to councillors and you know counselling between two marriage councillors <laughs> or something like. I was like, who's that? And why are they so famous? <laughs> no, my sister, who's on the Oma District Council, of course. Yeah. 
But we hear the My Lovely Horse, we hear version one. Well, we hear the, we actually go into the songwriting process first. Now you recognize the uh, the frustrations of, uh, of a songwriter hitting mental and the mental block there. I do, I kind of think, you know, when you're writing a song, there is the biggest question of all time. Do we write lyrics first? Do we write music first? Mm. Well, sometimes you write the music, sometimes you write the lyrics, sometimes the music doesn't match lyrics, and then you have to start from all over again. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, start, you wouldn't start from scratch again, would you? Uh, I've, I've, I've put stuff on the back burner and started again. Right, okay. Like, right. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't continue starting flogging a song the whole time. I would actually just, like, put that away. But maybe, start something new. maybe that's what you need, like, to do sometimes. Like, I, I, just, I don't know your, your songwriting process or anything, but, like, surely if you have something and it's 75% there and it's just taking so much work to actually marry the lyrics and the, and the melody... It might just be just you know another few hammers, uh, and just keep keep hammering at it, and actually just you know grinding at it until you finally get, ding. Yeah, I kind of think uh, that that does work sometimes. If you've got a deadline and you have to meet the deadline, then you just have to have to do it. Yeah. But I think it's better for the creative process to kind of put it away and come back to it because you get fresh air, fresh headspace, and you know I have went out. You know I've had some deadlines for you anywhere. Like I need to get this done. I need to get this done. So I'm like right ran out of cigarettes <laughs> ran out of cigarettes ran out of beer where's the nearest 24 hour shop like google maps and this is when i was in london i was like right the bus and we won too far away one and a half miles i walked and i smoked like a train on the way in and smoked like a train on the way back and got back in my room and started with my wee casio keyboard like Dougal. i'm going do, 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 do. because you know you always start with a pre-made backing track <laughs> well <laughs> it gives you ideas exactly so, you know, exactly they, i think they were ahead of their time there or they were definitely their finger was on the pulse yeah well the casio keyboard and it's a little uh it's a little play mode that you have there it's it definitely definitely was brought up in ted like it's just a little <laughs> and it's i'd be surprised i'd say you'd be surprised how many Songs actually started with something like that. Well, actually, a, a really interesting fact is Logic Pro is like the um, is the main songwriting software for a lot of people, and a pre-made loop that was on it is actually the uh, beat to Rihanna's Umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you well, know. every, I mean, uh, countless rock bands have started off with a simple beat that the drummers come up with, like. It's all in the process. It's all in the process. So Ted and Dougal have definitely got the process down. Yeah. Cigarettes, drink, <laughs> arguing, shouting, just they missed out the heroin. Oh yeah. Well, you don't want to, you don't want to get into that. I mean, that probably would turn them into you know proper artists, but then they'd be dead before the well, end of the episode. That's true. So. And they are priests, so it'd probably be very bad for them. <laughs> well, true. Yeah, true. They could put stick it in the holy water or something. Yeah, you know, get hide it some yeah, way. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I'd say if if you want to smuggle drugs into a country or anything anywhere. Get the priest to do it. LSD the... communion. That's yes. what you need. Yeah. Melts on the tongue. You're not allowed to chew it. Brilliant. Or even just make tabs <laughs> out of it. Just, just a, wee, a few wee MD onto the communion. And the ultra wine. That could be anything. For fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, yeah, the songwriting process. You say you say you go for the beer. I call that ideas juice. I, well, you know, you're yeah. right. You're yeah. right. I mean, I, I've been most productive in the corner of a Weatherspoons, uh, any different pro- to different cities, different parts of London, different parts of Belfast and stuff, in the Weatherspoons, find the quietest corner, just take my little £2.50 eel, and that's our, where I've done my most productive writing. So Exactly, I've done the exact same thing. I remember one time I was going to uni and it was cancelled, so I decided I was going to go to the pub. So I sat in the pub and I was like, right, have a beer. A Weatherspoons as well, actually, you know, £1.50, £2 yeah. for a drink, it's great. And why always have a business model like didn't have an idea so I read a book I read a whole book which came free in Weatherspoons and I got so many pulled great, it off one of the shelves yeah or? pulled it off one of the shelves and wrote um, wrote a song about one of the characters so Weatherspoons is very good about um, it's brilliant yeah and well I was about to go into Weatherspoons like maintaining the history of the building they're in but I'll not I'll not go into Weatherspoons I don't really like them at the minute yeah. Yeah. so fuck those bastards <laughs> 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 but uh, Dougal wants to get inspiration from different types of uh, music uh, rather than just you know traditional sort of guitar guitar singer, so he, he suggests uh, he just lyrics like I want to rub my fingers through your hair through your tail and I want to I want to hold you tight and I want to make <laughs> so tell us to pull him back from actually being in love with the horse, 
uh, and also he goes, take this uh, lump of sugar, baby, you know you want it. It's like something them rapper guys would do. Well, like, you know, exactly. I think that's the best thing about the songwriting process. I remember the first song I ever wrote when I was like 15 years old and I entered into the 2FM contest. It didn't get very far. Did you get to Top 11 or something? Was it not that one? No, this was the year before. Oh, okay, right. This was the year before. And um, I wrote, You smiled and eased the pain. You laughed and stopped the rain. You know, it was just like complete but that's, cheese, but cheese. That's that's a decent enough lyric. Right? I think maybe back in the nineties it would actually work quite well, yeah. but nowadays it doesn't really work. It's not edgy enough. You need more edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the second thing you go to in the songwriting process is rap because rap you can really let all your like the shit out. You know what I mean? You can really go, yeah, uh, <laughs> busting hoes, busting hoes. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, so Ted says you don't want to be going, doing it like ICT or Scoopy Scoopy Dog Dog. <laughs> Uh, do you think Poopy Scoopy Dog Dog would have been a better line there I don't think Poopy, uh, Pooper Scoopers were around back then but uh, that would have been a better Pooper Scoopers are a reasonably new thing are they not I'm not sure but maybe we should do um, a Lucas and kind of like reimagine the whole series <laughs> yeah. and put in new references and mobile phones instead of lightsabers etc yeah well it's <laughs> <laughs> Dave Lucas did <laughs> uh, but Scoopy Scoopy Dog Dog I bet you still uh, spelled it with D-O-G-G probably two probably. G's I wonder would it be scoop <laughs> dog. scoop dog. Uh, but yeah they, they fall into their creative differences very very quickly um, is that a good musical partnership would well exactly the Lennon McCartney thing it's, or it's, is it McCartney and Lennon it's Lennon McCartney um, but I think with uh, the songs that McCartney wrote it's now McCartney and Lennon I don't know yeah but w- which ones uh, see it's all the there's only like three or what four of the first, good ones egg or the chicken well what about Tarson McCartney Lennon how about, how about about that how about George gets his fucking well, exactly, day in the sun because exactly. he was actually the best songwriter of the three of them I think like he, he was on a higher hit race yeah he, he uh, uh, his sort of hits to duds ratio is say 10 to 0 it's a hundred percent. Well, you can't get any worse than "Step in the Christmas." It's one of my worst Christmas songs. That's Elton John. Oh, which one am I talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, the which one? The, the, the Paul McCartney or one? The Paul McCartney one. Oh, 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 oh yeah, that oh, one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. What? What are you on about? That's a great little I intro. No, oh, what's that? I like that one. Simply have you. Anyway, Ethan brought Michael Jackson down. With Ebony and Ivory, oh. which has already showed up in the show, by the way. The Paul oh, McCartney. Yeah. yeah, Graham Norton was singing that as well. A song I've never heard and still have not heard yet. He incidentally is now the host of the Eurovision Song Contest in UK exactly. TV. Exactly, it has come full circle now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which it, it is mental when you think about it. Like that, it's uh, a prophecy. Yeah, I mean, when when we were discussing Graham Norton, none of them had seen Graham Norton's late night chat show. Do you remember that show? Uh so very so Graham so Norton. So Graham Norton. Do you remember the content of it? Like it was oh, outrageous. It was, like it was outrageous. It was something completely. It was again something completely different that yeah. really worked. Um, and it was it was brilliant. Like, do you remember Madame PP and? Yeah. <laughs> like that was a that was a webcam model of somebody who was just peeing on command, basically. Yeah. Like and I remember Carrie Fisher went on the show one time and she actually loved it and kept coming back because she could not believe that this was allowed on TV. She really? says you can swear on TV and she oh was, well, in yeah. America you can't even well, swear on TV. Can, there, whereas over here, yeah. But, but it, I loved it. I loved it so Graham Martin. It was just that was like the that was the was it the nineties? It was, it was the nineties. The tail end of the nineties. Yeah. 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 Uh, and do you remember I had Andrea Corr on one time? I just remember this, and he had found uh, a website that was selling uh, you know recorders like musical recorders. Yeah. Uh, shaped like dicks, <laughs> and he wanted her to play it. Uh, but Andrea Corr very very wisely decided not to play it. She, she well she refused. I think it was because she's a bit. Uh, I would imagine she's very prudish. Would you imagine that? I wouldn't say she's British, you know, she's got an image to protect and a brand and she's very big in America, she didn't want to Sinead O'Connor it, did she? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I'd say there was also that element to it that she was trying to protect her image because if somebody got a screenshot of Andrea Corr with yeah. like a massive penis near her mouth, like it would go everywhere and probably would uh, destroy her career. But I do think she is, like I do think they're very clean cut and very, not I, no sex before marriage, but like... You know, no, Maybe we no need a referendum in that in Ireland to <laughs> see what actually people actually think. <laughs> we'll, we'll just have a poll. Well, yeah. So do you ever get the ride? <laughs> but I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm completely speculating. I have no idea about Andrea Corr, but I imagine she's no sex before the fifth date at least, like sort of during. Well, you know, that's not really necessarily a bad thing sometimes, is it? <laughs> well, it's, it's just different, different strokes for different folks. But yeah, that was Graham Norton's, uh, Graham Norton's input into into society, and now he's the face of Eurovision for. Actually, the UK. Uh, 
three years ago when I went to Eurovision, Graham Norton was actually on the plane that I was on. So, uh, oh, yeah. Did you get chatting yeah. him? He was really grumpy. He wasn't chatting in any way. He wasn't was chatting he to anyone. Out of, out of his arse, was he? Uh, no, this is on the way there. So, oh, well, so I hope so. He should be. You know, no. Let's do a Terry. Do yeah. a Terry. Get drunk in the show. Well, it was worth to mention that the two faces of the Eurovision for the UK have both been Irishmen. Uh, yeah, they've both been Irishmen and um, they're doing a great job. Well, <laughs> I it... think it's because um, the Irish sense of humour is is warm but cutting it's cutting but warm so yeah. like actually they watch the Eurovision Song Contest and they watch it just this is an amazing contest this is an amazing contest it doesn't really doesn't really work it doesn't really cut in our audience especially nowadays with the, the outlandish entries some people are putting in but I think having that warm humour about it not derailing the contest not not poking fun at the contest but having just you know, a couple of wee ribs at it. It's, yeah. And like, it, it does make the show. It does make the show. And I've, I've watched Eurovision in, like, many different countries. And, you know, there isn't that sense of fun there. So there isn't... Is it much more uh, sincere, is it? Or? Yeah, it's much more sincere. It's much more... But those are the countries that are winning, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, Sweden is winning. And they're putting a lot of effort but in. Sweden's Sweden's uh, musical output has been phenomenal for a country its size. Well, oh, come on. You've got Max Martin there. You... You know, well, you have to explain who Max Martin is, but you've got ABBA, you've got Roxette, you've got uh, Aqua, Aqua, you, like, and you know they're not just cheesy songs. They're not. It's not just Barbie Girl. Aqua had some brilliant songs. Well, Aqua was a brilliant band. Yeah. Actually, in Stanley, Aqua was also a pre. It was a mid-time show in Sweden after right. Sweden won, and I think it was ninety-seven. They were on in ninety-eight, and they were absolutely amazing. They like hit it out of the park, completely hit it out of the park. And this year. Uh, Justin Timberlake was the midtime show, not from Europe. Like, why are we having him here? Why are we having him here? The reason why they had him there was because Max Martin, who's a Swedish producer songwriter, he wrote that song. What, what song was it? Dance, 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 dance. It's it's, it? it's latest single. Oh, okay. But right, also, right. like Max Martin has written some of the biggest hits in the world. He's written um, "We Are Never Getting Back Together" for Taylor Swift. He's written "Oops, I Did It Again." Um, "Hit Me Baby One More Time." You know, he's written. He's written monster hits yeah, like, the, the repeatedly. Nine, yeah. yeah, the nineties hits, all the all them Backstreet Boy songs and, and you know, he came back in two thousand and two with um Since You Be Gone by Kelly Clarkson. Like, you know, he's he's no small he's no small fish in the songwriting right, circles. Yeah, so and if I could have a career like him, it would be, he, it would be he's pretty your, good. He's your actual hero, like you would love to emulate him. Oh yeah, definitely. Like Max Martin is I would say arguably one of the greatest songwriters in the world. Um some people might say, Oh, he's got no um he's not telling a story or whatever, but you know what? He's, he's talented. He's he. It he gives people what they want, and I think that's what song well, writing's he, all about. He writes a pop song and he writes it well. Yeah. Well, Father Dick Byrne felt that uh, yeah the the decision making process about uh, coming up with the the winner for the song for Ireland was a bit skewed or a bit at least a bit preordained. Yeah. And you and uh, this basically his accusation was that they were falsely or they were purposely picking the worst entry so they wouldn't win. And you, this is actually based on a bit of history. I think yes, that is definitely definitely the case. Like RT was going bankrupt um, with hosting the Eurovision Song Contest so much they won it um, two years in a row. They won it in like nineteen eighty seven, and you know they just could not afford the contest anymore. It wasn't like nowadays where the EBU pays for the contest, and you know it's it's a lot cheaper for you to to make it. Um, and I think this is why that happened, but. RT was going bankrupt in 1994. They were like, right, let's enter a song. So they entered Rock and Roll Kids by Charlie McGadigan. Um, who, was, who was like this old man with a guitar. Yeah, there was, yeah, it was two old men with a guitar sitting down playing the song Rock and Roll Kids. It's one of my favorite Eurovision songs ever. Um, but they thought it's not going to do it. It's not going to do well. It's not going to do well. Like we're not using the orchestra because back in those days they had the orchestra. But because it was something completely different it it blew everything out of the water and it won it, it completely won and that was the year that your uh, river dance was on as well um so what what is it about that it costs so much like it just, you know if you're hosting a contest with so many different countries coming to the contest you know and you it's don't a, have to pay the host like you don't have to pay the host but you have to pay to you have to broadcast this out over how many different countries? Like sure 38, con- 38 countries. And you know, like nowadays it's a lot more expensive, obviously, um, but it's a very expensive contest to hold. Right, okay. So it's, it was actually to its own 
detriment that it was actually winning all the time. Yeah, <laughs> well. it was to its own detriment, but you know, we got we got but national still. pride. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Rock and Roll Kids song actually just blew everything out of the water because it was the first song. It just had two old men t- singing about like the glory days in the sixties. We've mentioned a, a few of the rock and roll cliches that the the songwriting team of Ted and Dougal had to had to deal with. Obviously, the creative differences, uh, the Len McCartney thing. They also had to <laughs> chat, they also had to go in front of their own little X Factor uh, audition type process in front of uh, Ted or Jack and Mrs <laughs> Dougal. And Jack was much more uh, again. He's very efficient with his messages, so he just pulled out a shotgun, a live a, f- a live loaded shotgun, <laughs> by the way, which he seems to have at his beck and call anytime he wants to, and blew apart his guitar. Just like the Second Amendment says. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Let's have arms. We'll, let's we'll have arms. Right to bear arms. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the smashing guitars, massive rock and roll. Could you say? Well, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, the Who was, I think, the first one to sort of make a make a name for themselves doing it. But Jimi Hendrix uh, destroyed his guitar on yeah, stage. Yeah. At, Did he not light one on fire at one stage? That was as it. Well? Yes. Continue to play it or something like. But he was, he was lightly in the midst of a serious acid trip, uh, and yet still he was able to freaking play this thing. Yeah. And it was like, he was a lot of the time he was playing a right hand guitar upside down. Like his just just oh, his yes, natural musicianship yeah, was yeah. absolutely amazing. But he, yeah, he set this guitar on fire light at the Fillmore East, I think. Uh, and yeah, he tried to play it then, and then he started playing with his teeth and yeah. it behind his head and playing it like that. And he had some like communion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had, yeah, exactly. He had uh, the Craig Allen special. <laughs> uh, and uh, Muse, for early part of their career, were, went around smashing the guitars. They don't do it anymore. They're much more stick and uh, polished than more that. Professional, yeah. Well, their their stage shows now are, are like you know massive, you know big events like they, they're the only band sort of trying to keep up with the U2 mm. in stage performance and stuff but uh, yeah so it's, it's the sort of thing that's gone out of style big time but uh, smashing guitars I think so it should bring back smashing guitars <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the other rock and roll could you say is that the Norwegian band that uh, Dougal had uh, the record of all died in a plane crash really Be- yes uh, so there's been quite a few plane crashes in rock and roll history uh, mm-hmm. Leonard Skinner I believe were in one um, Buddy Holly Buddy Holly of course and the big bopper and uh, yeah, the day the music died, like it's there's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's something about playing like and Ozzy Osbourne's guitarist Randy Rhodes died in a plane crash as well. Uh, so there's something about rock and rollers getting on planes it seems to be seems to be a toxic combination. <laughs> well, maybe it's to do with the fact that they are the actual proper planes. <laughs> well, yeah, they're, they're usually <laughs> yeah. like this. But they flew in coach yeah. in the back of the easy jet, and yeah. then that's a lot less, and we're going to die. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're using these uh, tin pot things that have been sort of glued <laughs> together and. <laughs> At least, didn't, well, John Travolta could be flying them. Apparently, he's a very accomplished pilot at this point. Well, so. this is good. Maybe yeah. Demi Lovato could sneak on with some of her cocaine that she usually does when she's on a, yeah. on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. fantastic. Uh, but, yeah, so Dougal's band were called the Lynn Hugen and the Hugen... If I can kind of read my writing. And the Hugen Markers... By the Huguenots, uh, which is a play. Uh, I found this out on Wikipedia. A play on the Huguenots, which were a, a, a brand of early Protestantism. So there was a little, a little joke in there uh, about religion that very few people would have got, and I wouldn't, I didn't even get it. Like no, I didn't, uh, I didn't know. But as you say, they came fifth in the song for Norway in nineteen seventy five. So he's a proper Eurovision hipster. Like he doesn't just go for the mainstream, you know, like a satellite. That's that's too mainstream. I mean, all the way around you. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he doesn't go for the uh, he doesn't go for the mainstream well, stuff. Exactly. He, he goes he, right and deep, you know. This he is, liked it before it was cool. This is how on mainstream Dougal is: is the fact that he picks the country with the worst record in Eurovision, with the most nil point, and um, yeah, he picks a song that came fifth in their national contest. Now that is what you call a Eurovision lover. Yeah. I yeah. can just imagine him sitting on a plane beside him. Talking about Eurovision, <laughs> I was like, going, I don't even know what you're talking about, and I love Eurovision. Well, you, you don't. Oh, well, we're speaking of planes. You don't want to get on a plane with Dougal because, as we'll find out in a few <laughs> yes. episodes, uh, he has trouble with the airplanes as well. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so his, I mean, his entire record collection is just uh, really obscure Eurovision. Yes, because yeah, exactly. his record collection, of course, is one record. Um, but Ted's Ted's thoughts turn to theft very, very quickly. He immediately comes up with, "Hmm, I like this tune." Do you reckon I could rip it off? Well, doesn't Ted thoughts always come up about with yeah. theft? He, 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 exactly. Yeah, he's very. He's you know he's. And if he didn't bother putting that collar on, at one point in his life, he could have been a master criminal. He could have. He could have. Like his, you know, the only thing that stopped him getting away with that lure, with that uh, money resting <laughs> his account, is the fact that people were actually looking to see where that money was coming, where it was going from. Uh, but uh, yeah, so. <laughs> 
See, Ted says, oh, I don't think anyone's heard this. And Dougal says, well, it's the first time I'm hearing this. So he doesn't actually listen to his B-sides. Yeah. Do you listen to B-sides much? I do listen to the B-sides. Um, I actually bought, I think the first tape that I bought myself was uh, Celine Dion, My Heart Will Go On. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Who actually won the Eurovision Song Contest in 1988 with New Party Pants and what? For Belgium. Uh, for Switzerland. Uh, yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Um, yeah, the the B side in that was actually I like the song far better than my heart was on, but um, well, bands like Oasis and the Smiths put some of their best songs on the B sides. Noel Gallagher sort of has his head up as an arse. He was like uh, some of his best songs, like Talk Tonight, Master Plan, and the theme actually for the Royal Family uh, mm-hmm. was a Oasis B side. And he was like, "Oh, it's alright. Try don't write bad songs." <laughs> 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 that that was his attitude in the mid nineties. Of course, by the mid two thousands, he was like. Can I get them songs back? I need to fucking fill an album here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, they were in, uh, Ted and Dougal were in bed, and they were both reading quite uh, iconic musical literature. Did you notice what it was? I did not notice what it was. Dougal was no. reading Smash Hits, and Ted yeah. was reading NME. Ah. Do you ever... Uh, Smash Hits... Is... I, I, do you know what? I remember my mum used to work in a news agent, and she used to, you know, if she was working late, she would come up with a Smash Hits for me. Oh, very good. Yeah, I know. I had the stickers and everything, you know, of Boyzone and... Um, you, uh, well, and my like... sister used to get it, and I would only... I would just skip right past the, you know, the lyrics pages and see if there's any good lyrics. Because that was the way you had to get lyrics back in the day. You couldn't just fly onto A to Z lyrics dot com like yeah, you had you... to actually wait for the magazine to print yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, at the stickers you say like we, we had uh, we we had like a whole like desk at home just covered with like prodigy stickers like there were like Keith Flint was like this madman who had this spiky punk hair that you know was the absolute outrageous pop thing and it was just everywhere <laughs> scary Keith Flint and like little like you know memes almost before memes were just in in these stickers like. Yeah, it was it was odd how how we used to digest media. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it was probably better though. It probably was better. You know, you had to wait for things. You didn't. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you didn't have overload of information. Well, when the first concert was an Oasis concert in Lansdowne Road when I was fourteen, and I went out the oh. next day and bought. Well, I had to wait till next week till the Wednesday. The concert was on Friday. I had to wait till the Wednesday to get the Enemy and the Melody Maker. The Melody Maker's a lit great. The by Melody the way. Maker, yeah. Uh, and Ted and Google, they, do you ever get this? And I'm sure you do in the creative industry. You've you're so, you've got something you're really really excited about. Uh, you've you've made something like I've made a few plays. You made a few songs, and you're already thinking, right? I'm gonna what I'm gonna say when I get up on the Oscar stage, and what, what you're gonna say when you get up to collect your awards. They're already thinking the oblig the obligatory video. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so they already dreamt up this video uh, of my lovely horse, and it is the first time we hear the actual version that they intended to put on. Mm-hmm. It was. It has gone down now. It's one of the most <laughs> famous songs in Ireland. Like it's of the last twenty years, something definitely. Yeah, know. I I think so. I think I think the last um, St. Patrick's Day, me and my friend Stephanie just like we're sitting in London, strumming my ukulele, going, "My lovely horse running through the fields." <laughs> it is. It's one. Of, I think it's one of the best songs of um of of sitcom <laughs> history. Yeah, yes, it is. It's great, and people love it. Mm-hmm. My lovely, lovely, lovely horse. My, my lovely, lovely horse. And uh, yeah, that, that was written by Neil Hannon of the Divine Comedy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know he he's a, he is a brilliant pop songwriter. Yeah, he is yeah. absolutely brilliant. And, like, and again, I go back to you know back in the nineties, you had Neil Hannon was having top ten hits. You had mm-hmm. yeah, Lightning Seeds were having top ten hits. You had Beautiful Sight were having top ten hits mm-hmm. because these were just guys who could write pop songs. And they were getting onto the radio, and people were responding with the, like buying the records. Like yeah, I think Ireland has got like a massive tradition with music, and um, you know that that tradition of people just sitting in the house singing a song because they were too poor to have a TV. Yeah. Um, and you know that's what got families together, and I think that is you know that's why Ireland was so good at the Eurovision Song Contest because they had such a tra- tradition of storytelling and it's not just about writing music it's like telling a story through a song conveying emotion through a song because everyone knows Irish people are a bit you know they're not very good with their emotions yeah. so they do they do do it with their art and they do do it with their songs and this is why we've got the best poets and and for for an island that's, uh, for an island that's just so small we've Really, yeah, our cultural imprint on the planet has been ridiculous. Like, yes, it, it makes me love being Irish. Is our cultural yeah. impact on yeah. you know, as I say, poetry, art, music, particularly, yeah, and sport as well. The fact that we can compete, well, the Euros, we had a you know, quite a decent uh, showing, yeah, rugby, 
and then to inventing two sports and filling out eighty thousand seater stadiums with them. Yeah. Played by amateurs like it's. Yes, uh, But the, the music videos, the blue sequins jackets, uh, and the swimming pool with the swimming pool honeys in it. So they were clearly had their uh, their R and B or their hip hop influences <laughs> by getting the you know the bikini girls. It, 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 it looks like a very bad gay club, early 90s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're worried that they might might not be taken too seriously because they're priests. But uh, as Ted has, has told us, Father Benny Cake uh, had a big hit called Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've learned, of course, that that is Ultravox. And yes. Now, I did notice when they uh, when they came back from the ad break, they showed a picture of where the Euro song, or the song for Ireland uh, Heat was going to be was going to be performed. It's a very grandiose building. Well, you know, Eurovision is big business in yeah. Ireland, you know, and this is 1996. So once, one, three years in a row, didn't win in 95. What's going to happen in 96? Are we going to win? Should well, we? Necessary. We should win. Should well, the win? public vote has won five years in a row, as Ted has said. Wow. Uh, but uh, as the announcer said, it was in the Theatre Royal. Mm -hmm. uh, there is actually a Theatre Royal in Waterford, and very serendipitously, actually, uh, the man who plays Father Cyril Macduff is in a play in it this week. Ah. For the rest of the month. So if you're in Waterford, go down to the Theatre Royal and check out uh, Cyril McDuff actually, you know, treading the boards. But yeah, so we're introduced to Charles Hedges and Mr. Fred Wickwood, Rickwood, the producer and presenter of the Euro Song for Ireland. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Mr. Fred Rickwood is he's much better when he gets on stage than he is in person, isn't he? He definitely is. Um, he's a bit of a drunkard, isn't he? Um, he? He seems that way, but he doesn't actually seem to drink like. But he's. Like he, he doesn't have a drink in his hand or anything. He's just really, really slurry. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's just punch drunk. Maybe he's an old boxer or something. Maybe he is. Um, but maybe it's again, it's a, it's a little nod to Terry Wogan when he used to get drunk massively during the Eurovision Song Contest. During the actual yes, presentation. Yeah. He actually said um, one of the, the biggest tips that he gave Graham Norton when he took over was like, do not drink until song ten. <laughs> well, so he had a, he had, a he had a point at which <laughs> yes. it, was, it was okay then. Yeah. Uh, but there's a few lines I want to try and I want to try and uh, translate them as best I can. So this is just like in and out, a bit of giddy up, you know. So I think what he was saying was that's the business like in and out, a bit of giddy up. So what I think he was trying to say was it's a tough industry with a very fast turnaround. You have to be ready to move at any moment. This was in response to Ted saying uh, he's a real professional. He he's uh, he loves him last year's show. Also, could be a little joke about my lovely horse. Uh, well. Uh, possibly, yeah, possibly. Get it up. Get it up. Anyway, get it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm away, so I am sh uh, shave a bollock. <laughs> on his way out. <laughs> I think shave a bollock it is, is just a you know, good luck to you sort of uh, <laughs> phrase in certain parts of Ireland. But, uh, it took me a year. I've only discovered that tonight when I was watching it. I have never heard. I've never heard. <laughs> I'm away, so I am shave a bollock. And then uh, he comes back later on in the episode and... Uh, uh, yeah, Ted's he's about to go on stage. Oh yeah, sure. We'll find out later on, and we'll see. Sure. So he he actually is talking quite explosively, and then but when, he's not really talking coherently. <laughs> well, not really, no. But what he's saying, uh, to be honest, I think he's just rattling out words because when uh, Father Dick Byrne uh, protests that their entry wasn't taken seriously, there was a, there was a bucket, the throwing, the flying, there was a spade on top, and you were there the whole way. He says something to that effect. What I think it was, was there was the bucket, the throwing, the flying, there was a spade on top, and you were there the whole way. So I think he was actually lambasting Dick Byrne about their, you know, over, overzealous stage over -production, work. Overproduction, yes. overproduction. You know, if this was 2017, then, you know, that might win. But I have to give it, uh, you know, Dick Byrne should not be in the Eurovision Song Contest, and the biggest reason why he shouldn't is because he broke the rules. Of and they have a few celebrations, uh, Ted and... Ted and Dougal when they mysteriously win mm -hmm, possibly mm -hmm. because it's cost them too much to stage yeah maybe as we did discuss earlier that the RTE was kind of you know down on their luck in 1996 but actually in 1996 Ireland actually won again so <laughs> that actually yeah. is the, the comedy gold of the whole well yes after this episode aired about three weeks well about yeah about three or four weeks later Ireland won again with the Ireland voice. won again with the voice Eamon Quinn one of my favourite your version songs see as I well. can't I can't call that to mind what was that going like I am the voice in the wind and the pouring yes, rain I course, am yeah. the voice of your hunger and pain which the Celtic women do a mean version of actually well uh, you bring up the Celtic women uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago uh, one of our contributors mentioned that Declan Lanny had directed a, a concert movie of the Celtic women ah uh, and the voice is actually in that I think aren't, isn't uh, it possibly yes. but he, he actually Declan Lanny by the way director of Father Ted mm -hmm. uh, he Actually directed the 1988 Eurovision as well. 
1988 Eurovision. Yeah. Ah. Which is like that was a real uh, surprise bit of trivia yeah, for us. Yeah. But uh, oh, yeah, go Declan. He's, he's got serious directing chops then. He does yeah. definitely. Like you know, it's no it's no mean feat to direct completely different things. You know, yeah, going that's, into Eurovision, that's completely different discipline. Yeah, 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 and then going to like scripted sitcom. Yeah, and do such a fucking wonderful job as he has done. Exactly, but maybe again, it's write what you know. You know, yeah. or direct what you know. Like you know. Kind so of, yeah, he had a lot of he had a lot of uh, authenticity to bring to this. Yeah, um, and I think it actually goes to show when you're actually watching it, it actually does feel like an like Ireland picking a Eurovision song. You yes, know, it's yeah. just like let's all get all together and watch the late show and be like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it it comes at it with a very, uh, as you say, warm uh, embrace. Like it it is poking fun at it as it is because of Father Ted, but it's obviously celebrating it as well. I think I definitely think so. I think it's it it doesn't do Eurovision a disservice, does no, it? No, it, it actually is like yeah, you know what? We're really good at Eurovision. Well, not in a cocky way, but like you know, and, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but it actually does. It is a warm embrace to Eurovision and Eurovision culture. But they were celebrating and uh, they were passing around a bottle of champagne. I think that was Vive Flico, which, uh, having worked in the hospitality industry, I know is an extremely expensive uh, champagne. Mm. I think it registered, uh, it retails about 70 to 100 pound a bottle. What? And, uh, they in, get, in a bar or in a shop? Uh, well, I was working at a seafood restaurant at Ascot. Uh, oh, well, very right. hoity-toity. It was very hoity-toity. The uh, the Royal Ascot in one of the enclosures too. So they were getting keep, kept away from the mm-hmm. the like riffraff. The, the riffraff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hoity ploy. This reminds me of uh, hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Jack, but they got one half a glass out of it before Jack snatched it off him and just swigged at the bottle. So well, Jack likes to drink. Yeah, he does. At least like he's not drinking any Vix. Yes, exactly. You know. uh, v. Flacot will have to go into, into Drake's cabinet. Uh, <laughs> or Dettol. Or Dettol or Castrol GTX. It's still my favourite. <laughs> Should I sing you a Eurovision song? Yeah, I do it. Hold me now. Don't cry. Don't say a word. Just hold me now. And I will know that you're apart. We'll always be together. Forever is one. What do you say when words are not enough? Johnny Logan, 1987. And actually, Celine Dion won it in, in Dublin. She won in 1988, because Johnny Logan won it the year before. And then when I went to see Celine Dion in 2006, it was her second time in Dublin. Her husband, he went into the exact same betting shop because he bet that Celine was going to win the Eurovision. And... She did. And he went into the exact same betting no, shop. How much did he bet? Did he bet a full four pounds? <laughs> That's a man's bet. As we know from That Ted. is a man's bet. Yeah. That is a man's bet. Not not to get a million points, but... Um, oh, yeah, that's yeah. a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so when when uh, Dougal finds out that uh, Father Dick Byrne and Sarah McDuff are both entering, he's, he's a bit defeatist with us. <laughs> but Ted, then we know. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that for me is the end of the show uh, I remember that cracking me up the first time I watched that mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and just the sort of oh fuck's sake there's no point now <laughs> like, I remember in that age where you know you'd, we were in a, that was in a tiny school and we'd have to play yeah. football or something against the big school in the town which yeah. was St. Lawrence's and uh, I was like oh, there's no point in us entering there's only six of us versus 70 of them like, oh, well yeah, exactly yeah. like in our team it's going to be like every boy and it doesn't matter yeah, if you're exactly. good or bad you know <laughs> But the other thing I want to bring up with yourself now, Marty, is the Charles Hedges and Fred Rickwood's relationship. Uh, they're very, very open about it, mm-hmm. uh, straight from the start. They're a gay couple. Uh, when uh, just they suggest, oh, we're partners for 10 years, and Ted mm-hmm. says, oh, we were on the production company together. And he goes, no, no, we're lovers. You're as well. You're gay. Mm-hmm. Does that, did that have any effect on you when you first watched it? Or did you remember, did you recognize any of the, any of the awkwardness that Ted gets himself into when he's talking about it? I think when you're watching something like that, when especially when like what age we were when we were yeah, watching we were about it, ten or something, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like I was probably slightly too young to realize. Yeah, probably, yeah. However, you pro- you know, I probably had the the inkling. Um, maybe if I like if that was when I was thirteen or fourteen, you know, I would have actually felt really awkward because like you know everyone watched Father Ted together, didn't they? Yeah. Um. So. Even though I didn't feel it, I can actually imagine because I can imagine what it's like watching something else that came on TV at the time, and it is awkward. You're sitting there and you're going, uh, and your face is going red, and you're like, "Oh my god!" Like you know, what what do I say? Do I am I allowed to laugh at this? Yeah, you know, exactly. That's, yeah. I think that's 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 the thing. Even though at that time I didn't have that feeling, but I can imagine watching that when I was older, and 
I'd be like, this is really embarrassing, this is really embarrassing, like, oh my god, I can't laugh. And then, because everyone else is laughing, you kind of think to yourself, ha ha ha. Yes, you but, do that laugh yeah. that Ted does. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's exactly the yeah. laugh that Tez, ha- Tez has because you're actually uncomfortable um, in watching that and watching that being seen on TV because it wasn't really shown at no. that point, was it? It wasn't. Um, well, I was about to remark that it was probably the first time I had seen uh, a gay character being so casual about the fact mm-hmm. that they were gay. Mm-hmm. And. That was it. Like as far that was the entirety of their gayness was the fact that they were just two men in a relationship, and you the only the only element of their relationship you saw was when uh, Fred went on stage. He fixed up his tie, and he was complete professional. He was yeah. brilliant on the stage. Yeah. And then you see in the editing room, uh, you see Charles. He's like, oh, what a pro! Like with genuine awe and affection. Yeah. And that was the only the only bit of their relationship you actually saw. And actually, I think that a lot of TV shows and a lot of TV programs nowadays could actually look back on it and actually how to implement a gay character into the yeah, show. Yeah. Because, you know, the gay character is either always the comedy relief or the sidekick. And that isn't really what gay people are like in society. Yeah, gay exactly, people are your yeah. brother, your son, your 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 best friends, you know your, what I mean? Your boss, your yeah. the guy at work you hate when yeah. he doesn't pull his weight. Or, you know, it's everyone like it's yeah and i think a lot of shows nowadays could actually look back at that and think you know that really did break the mold yeah exactly exactly and i mean it does it does get into a really awkward situation Mm -hmm. for ted because well he's a priest (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah, he's supposed to be he's supposed to be flying the flag for this is wrong and he doesn't want to he clearly doesn't want to but he's just never been confronted with it before yeah which would have been very uh, prevalent in ireland at that Mm -hmm. time like Mm -hmm. Since that episode aired, like we've had Panty Bliss, we've had you know the gay marriage referendum, we've yeah. had like it's it's not really an issue. It's like it's it's really not an issue nowadays. Yeah. I think. Um, I mean, I might be wrong with it. Like, I'm. Oh no, definitely not. I don't think I don't think there is an issue at all now. I I think um, Ireland's really grown um, in in a social like structure. Like yeah. you know, we've got it's. It's, it's different now because like a lot of people just don't believe anymore so it does actually uh, I, don't, I don't know if, if a lot of people don't believe I do think a lot of people have not disassociated themselves with the Catholic Church but have sort of pulled themselves away from, from the rules from yeah. the rules of the Catholic yeah. Church so yeah I think that would be more and, a fair comment actually uh, and yeah like the kind of people who you would have thought would be you know the older people or whatever who you would have thought would be more against it their attitude is more ugh Sure, let them get involved with it then do you know what I mean exactly. and it's like, the, like the attitude is it doesn't hurt me why should I care sort well, of yeah. About it. yeah I think that's why everyone should live their life really yeah. so I, I remember watching Kachu the Worst again you, I was sitting there and you know there were so many people from so many different countries and Kachu the Worst actually when she went to the Eurovision she had this message of love and acceptance and I don't think that song is the best song that year but it was her it was that character um, Tom Newworth is is the um, the the person who the drag artist, yeah. yeah. Um, and just, just to remind listeners, it's the, the Austrian entry of uh, the bearded lady. Yeah, yeah, the bearded lady. Um, and she won. She was Austrian, and you know, it was that message of love and acceptance, and it was like you know, I'm going to rise like a phoenix. I'm going to be. I don't need to have people holding me down, like you know. And when you do bring me down, I'm going to rise back up. And I think that was the most amazing thing about standing in that contest and everyone just going, we love you, Conchita, because you are bringing everyone together. And I think that was her message. And it wasn't necessarily the song, but the song, the, the lyrics of the song kind of helped hone in that message. And that's why I think that, that won by a massive landslide that year because Conchita was different. Conchita wasn't like you know Conchita wasn't gay straight it was a bearded lady it was just like oh my god what is Conchita yeah. but Conchita's mess it doesn't matter what Conchita w- was because it was just love and friendship and you know let's be friends and well, let's spread our message of love around the whole world you've uh, you've actually just given me a flashback there to when Dana International won Dana International uh, won who in, was in Brighton actually was she post up? no one uh, or well, yeah, she, she yeah, definitely yeah, Dan International. Dan yeah. International is, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so she's a post off transsexual and uh, she in won. In Birmingham, from, she won, I think, was it, or Manchester, I'm not sure. Right, uh, well, uh, she was, 
But I remember coming in the next day and one of the guys. I need. I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> and a boy was sitting beside me in the class. And he was like, God, before I knew it was a man, I thought she was really good looking. And I give him stick for weeks. <laughs> He's like, Oh, he fancies her. He fancies her. He fancies her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, if. If that if they were ever to come together and but that's the funny love, thing is like, like the mentality. But then you know, if your mentality of a teenage boy, it's completely different. That's, you that's know. the thing. Yeah, uh, I know. mean, the thing, is, the reason South Park, I think, hits nail on the head so many times so often is because they, that is the mentality of a, like an eight year old kid or yep. eight to twelve year old kid. Like, and it's fine for yeah, it's fine for and them then, to have that opinion. And but then what you I love, grow about, out of it, yeah. yeah, you do grow out of it, and you you do grow up and realize that the world isn't just this like oh let's laugh at that because it's different. Let's yeah, laugh at that because yeah. it's different. And I think that's, and I think Father Ted actually opened a lot of people's eyes in yeah. Ireland to what else was in the world because back then you know there wasn't a massive immigrant population, there wasn't a massive uh, openly gay population, there yeah. wasn't uh, you know alternative lifestyles were still frowned upon because mm-hmm. the Catholic Church still had this vice like grip on you know public opinion yeah yeah you know Ted was reading the Irish Catholic like I remember finding you know, stacks of Irish Catholic newspapers yeah. in my aunt's house and, stuff and it was and like you know what what Mary down the road said about such and such when yeah. they were coming out of chapel you know it wasn't yeah exactly yeah exactly and it didn't really reflect society it was just like there was a smoke train in front of society yeah and the, 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 as you say when they're coming out of chapel uh, as I mentioned this in the thing before people would go to mass just for the social aspect of mm-hmm. it more than to be fucking preached about how to you know hate somebody else which is a yeah. lot of what religion is you yeah. know in my in my opinion well actually I was at a wedding one time and the priest actually said it's Adam and Eve not Adam and Steve <laughs> so um, I was just sitting there going hmm and I actually was doing a reading afterwards and my mom was like don't say anything you better not say anything and I was really, like right? yeah, um, and I was like mommy I'm not going to get him ruined someone's wedding like but yeah, um, exactly like but you know it's a, it's 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 hurtful when I can imagine yeah I can when imagine. you're sitting in a building you're celebrating love between two people but you know is was my love your... not valid is my love like from the point of view of the priest at that time is is my love not valid you know yeah exactly yeah. Uh, was it a priest who knew you no or, no no no, 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 no somewhere no. else was yeah. it right but yeah, uh, I think well, well, we'll go through a few other things. So some of the lists of the uh, this other entrants. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the standard ones was "You Dirty English Bastards" by the <laughs> Harry Bises. That sounds like a really good Irish <laughs> song. There, <laughs> it, it does. Uh, the Harry Bises is actually a real band. Ah. Uh, they're friends of Graham Linehan. No, well, this is according to Wikipedia, which I will put that uh, uh, that little caveat on. Uh, they're friends of uh, Graham Linehan. They do comedy Republican songs. I th- from what I can gather, they mm-hmm. sort of parody the Wolf Tones uh, yeah. sort of thing. Uh, but there is like there is a lot of bands like that who will just are very you know pro Republican and well, anti English. Well, it's my lovely horse a parody of Right On by Christy Moore. Right On, yes, for my money, the greatest glissando in <laughs> musical history. <laughs> yeah, like that's all you need to hear, and every Irish person knows exactly what song that is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful songs by one of the greatest songwriters to walk the planet. And it's a, it's about a horse. About a horse, <laughs> yes. Know? And yes, exactly, yeah. So that was the sort of the, yeah. the Craggy Island version. <laughs> the Craggy Island karaoke machine will have uh, will have my lovely horse. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Do you notice when Dick when Dick Burns preparing to go on stage and he's uh, he's giving Ted the old yeah. So so Ted is getting annoyed because Dick Burns looks so confident. And he actually does the whole. Uh, yes, I noticed that. The scratch your head yes. with the middle yeah. of your finger first, and then. But he, he doesn't. Goes, but it, like you know, he was just like not really noticing, and then it was like. Yeah, and then he decided, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just going <laughs> straight for it, and just give him the flipped him the V. It yeah. was the smugness of it all. Yeah. Then it was like, and then Ted's response was just. Yeah. <laughs> but Ted tried to give it back, give it back just as much, but unfortunately the presenter on stage saw him, so he had to oh, he had to turn turn the, uh, the scratching middle finger to the. They flip the V yeah. to the waves. So <laughs> he went. To a, he went a horrible journey there. But, uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, the other thing they heard. They heard the uh, song "Pipe Through the Elevator." Yeah. Now, that uh, they must have heard the pre. They must have heard my lovely horse that Father Ted was about to go on stage performing, and somebody must have noticed this at one point, especially since people are coming out of the elevator whistling it. Yeah. Yeah. So that wouldn't happen in this X Factor age where you know everything's filtered six weeks ahead of time. Well, exactly. Yeah. Do you think it's owned by Muzak? Music is that a company? Is it? Uh, music, yeah, yeah. They um they do elevator music. Oh right, I didn't realize it was a company. I yeah. thought it was just it's it's, it's a, a French company. Oh right. Well, I remember reading an article in Slate magazine or Slate website or something years ago, extolling the virtues of music mm-hmm. because it is actually 
if you're sitting in a silent elevator, it is actually really weird. Yeah. Especially if you know if there's a lot of strangers in the elevator as well. It's just having that little. Just I hope to be playing in an elevator someday. Yeah, well, th- th- think of the royalties. And yes, that, yeah. I know. <laughs> oh yeah, I love the I love Cyril's little spin on the keyboard. Oh yeah, <laughs> but it it goes to show that um, you know, the the priests from Rugged Island are just better. They are. They? You know, uh, they've Vin- got they've got a better keyboard. You know, yes, he's got uh, a better keyboard, a bigger keyboard. He's got an eight octave Casio yeah. instead of Dougal's <laughs> yeah. four octave one, or maybe one octave. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's just like they are always better, and you know. Everyone loves Underdog, don't they? And I kind of think this yes. is why it works very well. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, Vince did mention that before. Actually, he thought Rugged Island was called uh, Rugged Island because they were more ruggedly handsome and everything was just <laughs> slightly more polished on Rugged Island. Um, I don't think it was. I think it was rugged because craggy rocks, rugged r- yeah. rocks, like yeah. that sort of things. And we did have a Make the Maker, and I do have to bring this up. Um, at the end, when Arden, when they're, they're getting the results read mm-hmm. out, we have a translator. Uh, and that's Arthur Matthews, I think. You know, I can't be entirely sure about this because he does put on different colours to his voice when he's reading out in Ireland. No points there either. That's Ireland. No point. Uh, but I think that's Arthur Matthews. So now he's 4-1 up on Graham. Ah. So uh, yeah, I've been keeping score on that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've had no, we've had no aggro on still. So we're still on 29 now. Yeah, we had no Agua ones no, this time, no, no, I have to all. say. And Jack didn't even speak. Jack didn't speak. At oh, all. yes, he didn't. He just shot the gun, didn't he? He, you he know, just he shot was the gun. completely out of that. So. <laughs> yeah, and he, he just joined the, uh, joined the Norwegian. I actually the think Americans of Fowler Jack entered Eurovision now. He might, he might win. Well, <laughs> you know. But the Ireland's had uh, dust in the turkey. and That was a shame. <laughs> really? Why? It was just... It, it, it was kind of playing into the whole Eurovision thing of, oh, let's have just a complete novelty, but, joke, like, let, yeah. but not actually have it any good. Unlike Babushka, the, the Russian old women, you know, that was, they were cute and they were fun, but, you know, they also had a, a good enough song. Well, uh, let's wrap it up then. Uh, this has to be a top five uh, contender. It has I to be. think this is my favourite episode. <laughs> you, you've said that, yeah. yeah. So th- this would be your favourite episode of all time. Is that... Yeah. Because uh, because of the Eurovision connection, or just because you know, I think the yeah, I think it, there is. Um, I think it's like a party of Ireland in the Eurovision, yeah. so that's why I love it. Yeah. Um. I mean, there's just there's so many moments now. It, it, for the first few minutes, I was thinking, "Gosh, is this a top fiver?" I, I, I was generally mm-hmm. thinking it's actually getting quite slow to start with, but then when they started getting into the song, yeah, uh, getting <laughs> into the the songwriting process, and then going on to the rivalry. And the just the politics of Eurovision, yeah, and, yeah. and it's the most iconic like scene in exactly. Eurovision history or in the so Jet exactly. history. And yeah. then I realised oh, oh, I can't not have a top five contender without with uh, yeah. my lovely horse not being in it. So yeah. I mean, it is absolutely brilliant. It's eight point eight out of ten on IMDb. So the fans uh, clearly like love it, it as well. Uh, it's you know it's constantly on the like these Graham Linton's and Arthur Graham and Arthur's lists and stuff, and just you know lists by websites and stuff. So I mean, it is genuinely brilliant brilliant yeah. episode i agree i yeah. agree it's one of my it is my favorite episode i have to say yeah. it is <laughs> well we'll call it there then uh so we're on itunes now so give us a rating and review and uh marty you're looking for a singer where can we find you uh you can find me on uh soundcloud.com forward slash marty divine and um, you can send me a message on that um so yeah yeah cool come um, come get me brilliant brilliant <laughs> well thank you very much for listening and bless you bye Come on.